Welcome back for session two of our eight-part study. If God made the universe, why is it so old? We've all heard that the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, in this session, Dr. Ross, as an experienced astronomer, will be sharing things he's personally seen through powerful lenses. He will share what he's learned and show us just how incredibly true that verse is. So sharpen up your pencils and your minds as we dive into part two of our series. And I'll see you afterwards. Okay, in this session, we're going to ask the question, if God made the universe, why is the universe so very old? We're going to look at several reasons why the universe uh, must be old. The first reason is going to have to do with observability, is that we human beings are living at the unique time in cosmic history to observe the entire history of the universe. And if we were created any later in cosmic history than what we were, or any earlier, we would be unable to witness the cosmic creation event. We'd be unable to see 100% of the history of the universe. And there's very important reasons why we need to see directly uh, the universe being created. Now, to illustrate this, let me get this ball here. And the universe is something like planet Earth. We human beings live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. And so if you want to get from, say, Los Angeles to Paris, you can't take a straight line path. You can't take a shortcut through the Earth. You're constrained to travel along the surface. Universe is sim similar, but you have to add a dimension. All the stars and galaxies, all the matter and energy, is constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And forgive me, I'm ignoring the six tiny space dimensions that accompany the three large ones of length, width, height, and of course time is the fourth dimension. But it is such that if we were created any earlier in cosmic history, light from the beginning of the universe, light from the cosmic creation event, would not have adequate time to travel on the surface of the universe and reach our telescope. So, for example, if we were created five billion years ago, we'd only be seeing about two-thirds of the history of the universe, and we'd be forever ignorant of the data from the cosmic creation event. Keep in mind, in astronomy, we're looking back in time. It takes time to travel uh, from distant stars and galaxies to reach our telescope. Now, if we were created any later, we have the problem that dark energy expands the universe, the surface of the universe, at greater than the velocity of light. And you say, what's this dark energy we're talking about? Well, the best analogy I can think of is that it's like an anti-elastic band. I've got an elastic band here in front of me. It has the property that the more I stretch it, the more energy it gains to force contraction. The surface of the universe is the opposite. The more you expand that surface, the more energy it gains to accelerate the expansion of the universe. And there's nothing physical to prevent it from expanding as fast as it wants, even up to infinite speed. So as the universe is uh, thrust forward with more and more rapid expansion, thanks to dark energy, there comes a time when the space surface expands at greater than the velocity of light. And when that happens, distant objects, that light will never be able to get to our telescopes. In other words, there's a moment in the history of the universe when the universe is exactly the right age so that human observers can see 100% of the history of the universe, including the capacity to directly witness the universe being created. And it's our ability to witness directly the cosmic creation event where we get the most compelling, rigorous scientific proof that a God beyond space and time, a personal God, created the universe for the specific benefit of human beings. So to review, only at 13.7 billion years after the cosmic creation event can human beings observe all of cosmic history and directly witness the universe being created. Now, that's one reason. Uh, a second reason 
that the universe must be uh, the age that it is, is that, by the way, this is the only equation you're going to get in this entire series, but it's a very easy equation that you all ran into when you were in elementary school. Um, in fact, I could use an elementary child as an example. As we watch a child grow up, what we notice is that the size of the child is calculated by the formula, the rate of growth of the child times the age. So a 12-year-old child is about twice the size of a 6-year-old child. Well, the same thing's true of the universe. As the universe gets older and older, uh, its size gets bigger and bigger, and it's such that we know that the age of the universe uh, must be its size divided uh, by uh, its rate of expansion. But here's the problem. If the universe expands too rapidly from the cosmic creation event, then gas will be dispersed at such a high rate of speed that gravity will not have the power to collect any of the gas to make galaxies and stars. In other words, if the universe expands too rapidly from the cosmic creation event, the entire universe remains nothing but dispersed gas. And without galaxies, stars, and planets, life would be impossible. Now, if you go the other way and you expand the universe too slowly, now gravity collects all that gas efficiently and collapses it all into neutron stars and black holes. So the universe would be nothing but black holes and neutron stars. Now, the minimum density of a black hole or a neutron star is 2 billion tons per level teaspoonful. So can you imagine having a little cup of coffee and putting in a level teaspoonful and it weighs 2 billion tons? That's what a black hole or uh, a neutron star's uh, density is all about. It's so dense that molecules are impossible. Atoms are impossible. Even protons and electrons are impossible. The density is so great it fuses all the electrons and protons into neutrons literally neutrons touching one another all the way down to the core, and a black hole is even denser than that. In such a universe, life clearly is impossible. Life requires molecules. So the universe must expand at a just right rate so that you can get stars, galaxies, and planets, and therefore have a home and a chemistry where life would be possible. That can only happen if the universe expands at a specific rate. And it can only happen in terms of life that requires a certain expansion of the universe, a certain development of stars and planets and galaxies where you actually can have planets on which life is possible. So in the early history of star formation, you don't get planets. Those stars produce other kinds of stars with more heavy elements. Finally, you get planets. But if you wait too long, uh, also those planets do not become capable of having life. So one reason why we know we must not live in a universe about 14 billion years old, only such a universe would permit the existence of advanced life. The universe must expand at a particular rate, uh, giving us an age uh, that would uh, make life possible. Now, there's a third reason why the universe must be as old as it is. And let me uh, show you uh, planet Earth here. And uh, I want you to kind of look at this globe and just tell me, what are the most striking features you see here of planet Earth? Okay, it's got water. What else does it have on its surface? It's got land. You know, we astronomers are now finding hundreds of planets outside of our solar system. And we're beginning to find planets that are the, right, the same size as the Earth, the same distance from the star as Earth would be, planets in which water could possibly exist. In the next few years, it wouldn't surprise me if we find over 10,000 planets that would be water worlds uh, like Earth. But what we're discovering in the few planets we've found that are the same size of the Earth and the same appropriate distance where liquid water be possible on the surface is they're super water rich. Water is the second most abundant molecule in the universe. And the few Earth-like planets we've discovered have about 10 to 50 percent water. Our planet, by comparison, has less than 0.03 percent water. There is water on the surface, but just a thin layer. 
And so our planet is extremely water poor. And because it is so water poor, we can have oceans and continents together. Now the other thing you notice about this planet is that it has water in all three states. Clouds, that would be the vapor. The liquid water, the blue part. And as I showed you Antarctica, there's the ice. Our planet has water in all three forms. It may be the only planet in this universe that has water in a stable fashion in all three states, able to exist for a long enough period of time where advanced life would be possible. So we live on a very special Earth. Many astronomers are convinced Earth is the only planet in the universe that has oceans and continents in balance with respect to one another and has water in all three states. Now, what is it that makes that possible? What makes it all possible is Earth is the universe's uranium and thorium champion. Uranium and thorium. Those are long-lived radiometric elements. And it's because our planet is so enriched with uranium and thorium that it has an interior energy source that drives plate tectonic activity. And it's plate tectonics, earthquakes and uh, volcanoes, that causes our planet, which started off as a water world with ocean covering the whole surface, being transformed in a planet where we've got oceans and continents in balance with respect to one another. Because of the great amount of uranium and thorium, we also have a strong, long-lasting magnetic field. And it's that strong, long-lasting magnetic field that prevents our atmosphere from being sputtered away by the radiation from the sun. So we have a stable atmosphere suitable for life thanks to the uranium thorium. We have the oceans and continents existing together on the surface thanks to the uranium and thorium. And when I say Earth is uranium thorium champion, we're not kidding. Planet Earth has 16,000 times more uranium and 23,000 times more thorium than any other body of comparable size and density anywhere in the universe. So we are the champion by factors of many thousands of times. Now, where do we get all that uranium and thorium? I don't have time to give you the complete story, but let me just kind of give you a thumbnail to get you started. Uranium and thorium comes from only one source in the universe, and these are supernova eruptions. What's a supernova? It's a supergiant star, and supergiant stars burn up quite quickly in a few million years or less. And then when they end their burning cycle, they explode. And in this slide, you can see a supernova eruption in a relatively nearby galaxy, and at maximum light, that single star outshines the light of the other 200 billion stars in this particular galaxy. So it's a dramatic event, and it literally showers the galaxy uh, with the heavy elements that have made through its nuclear furnace. That's the only source of uranium and thorium in the universe. And it is such that when the universe is young, it's producing many stars. As the universe expands, as it gets older and older, there comes a time when the rate of star formation begins to subside. In fact, today, about 90% of all the galaxies' star formation has ceased. We live in one of the few galaxies where star formation is still going on. And so what this tells us about the uranium and thorium abundance of the universe is that it begins to increase the abundance of uranium and thorium as star formation is aggressive. And then when star formation begins to subside, then the quantity of uranium and thorium also subsides. Why? Because they're radiometric. They decay with respect to time. So there reaches a point where the production of new uranium and thorium through star formation can't keep pace with the uranium and thorium that's radiometrically decaying. Now astronomers are able to look in detail at the star formation history of the universe, the physics of uranium and thorium uh, production and decay, and calculate when uranium and thorium reached a maximum abundance in cosmic history. And as you can see by the slide, that happened when the universe was a little bit more than nine billion years old. That's when uranium and thorium hit a peak abundance. The universe 
is 13.7 billion years old. So you can do the math. That means that the peak in uranium and thorium abundance occurred uh, 4.5 billion years ago. And uh, we have several very good radiometric dates for the age of the Earth, and that comes in at 4.566 billion years ago. What I want you to notice is these two dates agree. In other words, planet Earth formed at the very moment in the history of the universe when uranium and thorium reached a peak abundance. That and two other special events in Earth's history explains why our planet is so extraordinarily rich in uranium and thorium and therefore has the unique possibility of having continents and oceans on its surface and a strong enduring uh, magnetic field. Now a question you might ask then is, why did God wait the extra four and a half billion years? Well, there's actually several reasons why he waited that long. Let me just give you one. Namely, that it takes about four and a half billion years for uranium-235 to decay down to a safe level for human beings. Uh, there are several different isotopes of uranium. The one that uh, we see all over the Earth today is uranium-238. It is a decaf life decay of about four and a half billion years. Uh, but if you go back in time, there was a lot of uranium-235. Uh, its half-life is a little more than 700 million years. And so for the first few billion years of the Earth's history, our planet had significant quantities of uranium-235. Now that's the stuff we harvest to make atomic bombs. It's the stuff we harvest for our nuclear power plants and it's able to generate a chain reaction. And actually what you see in this slide is a, a photograph of a, a region in uh, the country of Gabon, uh, Oklo Gabon, and the scientists have discovered there a fossil natural nuclear reactor. In other words, a couple of billion years ago, in this location in Africa, uh, uranium-235 uh, was a sufficient density that it was generating a natural nuclear reactor. Now, it didn't result in an atomic bomb because there was water there. And the water is what set up the chain reaction, actually caused the neutrons to be sufficiently dense. It got a chain reaction going, uh, but that generated heat. It boiled off the water, and the water boiled off. That shut down the reactor. But what geophysicists now know, in this part of Africa, there was this natural nuclear reactor that was firing up, as liquid water came back and then shutting down when the liquid water vaporized. So it was going on and off, on and off repeatedly until the quantity of uranium-235 became too small to sustain the reactor. There are no such natural reactors on the planet today because uranium-235 is decayed to such a low level where that can't happen. That's a good thing too because you don't want to be walking around on our planet when there's lots of uranium-235 around you'll die quite quickly from cancer if that were the case. Now, in a future session, we're going to examine several more reasons why the Creator would wait an additional four and a half billion years after that nine billion years in order to create human beings. There's actually several reasons uh, for why uh, you would uh, want to wait till that period of time. But what I've given you here in, in a short period of time is three independent reasons why the universe must be approximately 13.7 billion years old, which allows us to develop another paraphrase of John 3.16 for the New Testament. I can word it this way in the context of cosmic age. For God so loved the human race that he willingly invested 13.7 billion years of meticulous design to make a place for us to live and enjoy life and actually watch through looking back in time to our telescopes, the entire history of the universe, including our capacity to watch God directly create the universe of matter, energy, space, and time. And therefore, the confidence that the God of the Bible, through direct scientific observation and proof, is responsible for the universe and designed it very meticulously throughout those 13.7 billion years so we could have a great place to live. I think what you've seen we've done in these first two sessions, showing you how much stuff, space and mass the universe that the creator invested to make a home for us 
and how much time. If the creator put that much time and that much investment in terms of material resources into preparing a home for us, surely he must love us. Surely he must have a very high value on the human species and surely he must have a very high purpose uh, for creating us. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next uh, few episodes is taking you through the value of the human species, the purpose of the human species, and what we've got to look forward to in the future. Okay, look, I don't know what kind of schools they have in Canada, but I definitely did not have physics in junior high. Nor did I learn the equation size divided by rate of expansion in elementary school. But you know what? I'm sure glad Dr. Ross did. Because guys like me, we need guys like him to help us wade through all this advanced science stuff. When I think about what we just heard, I think the most compelling thing from this last session is the fact that we were placed on this earth at just the right time in cosmic history to optimally view the cosmic creation event. Now that's personal. God wanted us to see his glory, and we have, in a unique and wonderful way. Okay, I hope you've come up with lots of good questions. And remember, we have all kinds of resources and help for you on our ifgodthemadetheuniverse.com website. We even have trained apologists just standing by waiting to take your questions via email. So please feel free to take advantage of everything offered to you in this study. Have fun with your Q&A discussion, and I'll see you at our next session. <laughs>